I, I'm never clear when you're actually going live, like when it actually goes live. I never trust it, but it says we're live, so oh, good. what the heck. Uh, Tom Shalhoub here. I don't here. trust Tom, so it's perfect. Yeah. He doesn't trust the technology, I don't trust him, it's a perfect match. Hello? How to be Tom Shalhoub. Starring Tom Shalhoub. You know, not everybody wants to be Tom Shalhoub. But for those people who do, I guess this podcast is for them. I mean, you got to model yourself after someone, right? Might as well be me, Tom Shalhoub. You can probably see we're here with Dr. Drew, and we're doing a live video, which is yeah. also going to be a podcast. Yeah. Uh, as I told Dr. Drew, what I like to do sometimes is just turn the camera on, and we go live, and then I'll just take the audio from this, unless it's terrible and you're embarrassed by it all. Well, so far, I have questions. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> then I'll just put, okay, the, put the MP3 into my, my podcast. So, uh, Drew, thanks for being of here. Of course. Let's start with like a kind of a current events thing Ugh. because you just sent me a text and I, I don't oh. know what yes. it entails. I, I sent you where to buy tickets for an event that uh, I'm going to be moderating. I'm the literally the moderate moderator at this event in San Jose. I think it's the San Jose Civic Center um, with Asim Malhotra and RFK Jr. And we're going to be talking about government capture, regulatory capture by pharmaceutical and healthcare oh. and food industry. I'm very interested in all that. And, and RFK, I've interviewed him a couple of times. And it's interesting, the first time I interviewed him, he went, you are so brave to interview me. And I thought, I just am interested in what people have to say. I, yeah. I'm not brave, I'm just, this is a time to kind of explore things and figure out what's going on. God knows the world gets worse every day. I mean, I got canceled on every show I was supposed to be on today, except yours. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's just the situation that's going on in Israel. It's horrible. caused the breaking news, and so then you're normally lighthearted guests. I mean, I guess you would be on the lighter side of things usually, yeah. and you know, myself, people want me on to do kind of usually. No, like, you're going to be talking military ambassadors, yeah. intelligence. So yeah. That's who you're going to talk to. I mean, to. I could do it. That's who I go to listen to. That's what I want them to interview. Yes, you know? and uh, and. Uh, sort of experts, you know, uh, yeah. on various, various topics of intelligence. That's the thing is that I don't think I'm ill-equipped to speak on uh, on any subject yeah. of the day. But the yeah. thing is, if Fox News thinks of me as the comic relief guy, right. and then they cancel me when I'm on breaking news, yeah. I don't want to, you know, take offense at that and say, no. like, you know, you know, it's people have their strengths, and if you're going to have no, a general they, on, they cancel me. everything for breaking news. You know yeah. what I mean, I remember I was at CNN for almost 10 years. Right. And they would cancel us all the time for breaking news. It's just all the time. Yeah. Uh, people forget. I was uh, I was a CNN. I had a show on HLN. I was on Anderson Cooper regularly. I was on Don Lemon almost every night for long, long periods of time. What was your HLN show? What was it called? It was called, it had different names. Uh, I think towards the end it was called Dr. Drew or Dr. Drew on Call or something. Yeah, like because headline news was, yeah. it was, uh, you had yeah, I CNN. I, I was right before Nancy Grace, I think. Right. So And, and we ended up covering... A lot of court stuff because Nancy was killing it with that. So we would sort of pick up on it. We had a whole different take. Yeah. I would bring in a bunch of psychologists and jurisprudence experts and stuff. We'd sort of right. try to figure out what's going on with these people and what, what's likely to be true, you know, based on human reality. And she would do her thing, her Nancy Grace thing. Right. Uh, and we got great ratings when we would do that. And then we got a new guy in. Jeff Zucker put a new guy in that announced that we were going to have a new new network based on social media. Right. And uh, was uh, was Glenn Beck on at that time? Because Glenn Beck was HLN, wasn't he? No, he. I think he was a CNN. I'm pre pretty sure he was CNN. Okay. So it was Jane Velez, Mitchell, me, Nancy Grace, yeah. and and um, Joy Mayhar was on with right? us for a while. And uh, she brought me in to be a, a possible sidekick for her. Believe it or not, when people the way that the world has this is the part people don't get. Yeah. The CNN was a very. I, it, I never had any problems over there. I yeah. fit right in. 
No one ever told me what to say. Nobody, I was never saying anything that seemed out of line with what they were doing there. And now I'm not invited back. <laughs> And yeah. Same thing with you, I imagine. You're not, well, yeah. you're not on the View regularly. No, and, and, so. and the thing, I used to open for Joy Behar when she was doing oh, stand up, no and kidding. so I would come in as a comedian and just do the in, job. Interesting. And she liked, uh, you know, working with me. I used to be on her show all the time. On your show, I like Joy. I like working with Joy. She's very smart. I, I pulled out a picture the other day. It was a story, a live storytelling show. Me mm. hosting it. My guests were Joy Behar and Gavin McInnes. Wow. And she got to she got along with him. Of this course. was a decade ago, like ten years ago, you know, twenty not even probably twenty fourteen. Five six years ago, all those people got along. Yeah, it was yeah. really sort of into 2016, 2017, Everybody went haywire. Yeah, and uh, that was that. So the but, but I, I want to say I, you know when we're on gut I, I think I was on Gutfeld with you last time maybe yeah. or something. And uh, when he takes aim to joy in some of the view, I was on with Anna Navarro all the time on, yeah. on Anderson Cooper. I get very uncomfortable. Oh, you do? Because and sometimes he takes aim at people that are really my friends. Yeah. Like still my friends. I, I manage to maintain. Because I'm, I'm so moderate. I'm so in between everything. Well, you so. have to do that. And you... Uh, no, I used to I used to fight the right. Yeah. I used to have to fight. I was... Remember, I was advocating for HPV vaccine. I was advocating for morning after contraceptives. And I was fighting them on that. And then all of a sudden, whoa, it went the other way. I, I feel like these frames... I just sit here in the middle and the frames just keep going back and forth of what a right and left leaning person is believing these days. But did you change at all? Or do no, you feel like no. you've been steady? I have been. Uh, if anything, I've gotten more moderate. Like more, I thought I was more of a libertarian, yeah. frankly, until I met Kat Temp. And I thought, oh, I have a heart. I yeah. can't be libertarian. Right. Okay. That woman is a libertarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and she's harsh. And, uh, and my friend of mine, uh, do you know Leo Terrell? Yeah. Yeah. He used to give me shit about this. He would always go, oh, because I was complaining about stuff I wanted to do for the homeless. He goes, oh, oh, Miss Libertarian, who do you want to do that? I go, government. He goes, oh, Libertarian? Yeah. You want the government to fix that? And I thought, all right. All right. And so I had to watch it. But, so I refined my middle ground position. And I'm fascinated by people that are stirring the pot, like RFK Jr. and uh, Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy. I've interviewed him a couple of once. Who is this other guy that you said? So the, the, on the panel, you're doing. Is, so it's, is it a two uh, person? It's, it's Asim Mohatra, who's a cardiologist, who has been very concerned about the vaccine. And the I know vaccine. he's been on Rogan. Yeah. Uh, okay. Smart guy, good guy. I was one of the first guys to interview him because I saw some of the stuff he was writing. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I want to talk to him. Yeah. And uh, don't agree with everything, but uh, but it's important to think about these things, right? Because now we have all this myocarditis data. And there is a paper that was published three days ago in circulation yeah. that was breathtaking. It really upset me. It, it has to be confirmed, but it suggests as many of half of the young males that get myocarditis, which is relatively, I mean, it's, it's uncommon, but not that uncommon relative to serious risk of the illness, the COVID illness, it's rather common compared to serious consequence of COVID in that age group. And half of them are going to have long-term, lifelong cardiac problems. Yeah. It was, it took my breath away when I read it. And so that really upsets me. We'll see where that goes. Yeah. Anyway, Seam is, is worrying about a lot of stuff. He's worried about the vascular disease and stuff. And then I'm, some woman whom I don't know is a, um, a big food person. Like what's in our food and what, what has captured there. And then RFK Jr. is going to do his thing. And he's kind of does both of them. Obviously, he does everything big on the vaccines, but he's also very big on like nutrition and his uh, food and, and and military. So his thing is where the government has been captured by corporations. Yeah, which I share his concerns. I, I I want regulators to be regulators and to be able to do their job and not be people who used to be in the business or regulators to go down to the business. That that back and forth shouldn't happen. In other words. Look at look at where people go who are working the FDA. They go work in big pharma. Yeah, yeah. Where does big pharma work? They work over at CDC. So that's what yeah. regulatory capture is. That that the, the cozy, industries the, capture the people. They capture the people and maybe our 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 uh, elected officials with money. Yeah. So there's different kinds of capture. There's a good question. That's something I'm going to ask RFK Jr. What is the extent of capture? Yeah. So I, I had an idea that I was thinking about because people always say you know the. The, um, we should talk for an hour, not 25 minutes. We're not going to make it in 25 minutes. Well, I know. Because we, let's keep I, I tend to be very free. And, let's and, do it. And, okay. Me too. I love it. Uh, but the this was my concept that I Can never knew anybody talked about. Do they have questions out there? Can we uh, see if there's a... We probably could. Because of chat? Uh, it, uh, 
I get worried that when I look at the, when I try to look, look at, at the chat phone. that I'm gonna disconnect no, it. No, look at your phone. Okay. Just just put it right side up. Just uh, you'll, it'll it'll no 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 just. What do you mean? Just do it like this, and there should be. This phone though is helping that camera. To I know. Take I me. get that. There should be. That's why I'm glad that it's not it's not reacting to you. <laughs> All right. All right. I give up. What, what platform are you streaming on? I'm doing because I use this uh, this Mevo camera. Yeah. And then I just go out to YouTube and so uh, Twitter at the same time. Okay, YouTube and Twitter. So it's like, like I'm, multi, go on I'm on the multiverse. What what is? <laughs> What uh, Tom Green used to call the Webovision. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to look at Twitter. Yeah, look at Twitter. While I formulate this thought. Okay, go ahead. And everyone's always doing, we got to have uh, term limits, and then we've got to have people that, you know, you you uh, you you uh, don't allow them to go into the industries they regulate uh, for a certain amount of time and for all something. that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. How about this? Shorten uh, or... No, I don't, everyone... I, I don't have answers. I really don't. Okay. Oh, here it is. Then... Oh, quiet. Okay, yeah. okay. We're we're on a Spaces. We're, have people that... we're actually on a, 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 a Twitter Spaces. Oh, we are. That's oh. funny the way they've done it. Then because I'm going through the camera. Wait, it's a little different. It's a little different yeah. than a Spaces. You're right. It's just a Twitter video. Twitter sort of Live, yeah. Which is like what used to be Periscope. Uh, yes, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Uh, but but hang on. You, so if you guys want to just all right, I'll tell you what. Tag me. At Dr. Drew, and I will watch my my uh, stream here, uh, and you You're tell me if you have a questions. multitasker. Because when I watch your uh, show, I, mean, ask, I was going to call Dr. it a podcast, Drew. but no, it's, it's a Dr. show. Yeah, it's a show. It's a TV it's Tuesday, show. Tuesday, Wednesday, th and Thursday at three o'clock Pacific. Though tomorrow we're going to do it at one o'clock Pacific with Rob Schneider. Oh yeah, okay. And, and a special guest, a couple special guests actually. One o'clock Pacific. Yeah. So it's four o'clock here, yeah, exactly. and then I have to wrap up and run over here to oh, do yeah. Gutfeld. If they still broadcast, right? They might not do it. They might not do it tomorrow. Yeah. But it's scheduled to have a show tomorrow. Okay, good. But here's the thing. Okay, What's you thing? multitask on your show, and you have yes. questions come up. Yes, you take this, and then you go into an ad for this, yes. and you go into. And I, I asked, "How do you do it?" And you said, "It's easy." And my, my wife does it. Like you, you know, it's super. I the thought bubble over my head as I walk through my life now. It's like. This is all so much easier than practicing medicine. You have no idea. You, have no idea. you don't even understand how much easier it is. So I could, they can ask me to juggle anything. It's still easier. Still easier than I just think the the all the things that are coming into your show. Mm. It, it, it's very. Um, it's like a broadcast channel. I mean, it is a yes, broadcast channel, yes. but you're you're doing it all yourself from your home. It's quite yeah, amazing. It's really. I'm yeah. going to figure out how to do it. No, it's an incredible thing that we live in this day and age when you and I can go out to internationally right now. And yeah, I can. We have set up a little studio in our home. The, the, by the way, the original thing was, I wanted to. I I was so upset by all the fear and anxiety mongering in during COVID, particularly that first year. Yeah. And I was doing a nightly news broadcast on a local news channel in Los Angeles. And the news director came up to me after, we were like into it probably six months, and he goes, this is an extinction event, right? I was like, extinction event? This is nothing, what, oh my God, What? If, you're a news, what have we done to people? Yeah. That is, in, that is it's a, a billion miles from that. This is a respiratory virus. And so, uh, it, 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 my my instinct with that streaming show at the very beginning was sort of be like the French underground. Yeah. And just quietly give out information and try to help keep people stay and, cool. And you did that. And we talked one time. We were yeah. in here doing a, a, a show very early on. It was before they shut everything down. But it mm -hmm. was when the panic was starting. Yes. And you and I were very uh, uh, much... Uh, you know, talking about how everyone was losing their minds. Yes. But then I almost thought that there was a sense when I would watch your show, you kind of did have a mea culpa and you were like, wait, I'm back. I'm taking this more seriously now. But then you kind of came, did, did you go in kind of a wave? Would you? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I, I mean, I learned things like other people. I, I still, as I look back on my excesses, um, A, I got a little hubristic. That's, that is the enemy, man. Irrational certainty is the problem of our time. Uh huh particularly on medical topics. There's no certainty on medical topics. There's rational uncertainty. And I started pushing so hard against the panic mongering, yeah. I got I got excessive. I got I became excessive. So I, and I said I, I and I started using comparisons and things, but you know, by the way, there is a comparison. I was just reading a data a, a paper, a very very elaborate paper from Hong Kong 
that was saying <laughs> Omicron uh, hospitalizations are still you know less than H1N1. And that was the comparison I kept making. It's like, we just went through a pandemic, yeah. and you don't even know it. Yeah. And now we're going through a worse one, but we're going to freak out about it? I, I, that's what I was sort of going like, no, don't yeah. do that. And we'll, we'll, I kept saying, by the way, and when people took aim at me, they, they cut this part out. And this part also turned out not to be a good idea. Uh, I said, just listen to the CDC and listen to Fauci, and we will get through this. Right. Fauci was one of my heroes uh, back in the AIDS epidemic. I was deep working in that back in my early days. And he was extremely good leader for that. I mean, he really, I, I see some of the same tactics that came back in this pandemic, and it was not <laughs> appropriate for this one. Uh, but... I always appreciated him during HIV and AIDS. It was an incredible time. And uh, so I just kept saying that. Of course, everyone cut that part out whenever they show a video of me saying something yeah. excessive. But and I apologize. Probably, I'm I've, assuming, though, that what? you've walked walked back on that because we shouldn't have trusted the CDC and Fauci, right? Yeah. Correct. That so, was a mistake. Yeah. It, well, if they had done what they'd always done, I would. I mean, they, they surprised me. Even then. We would have been better off than listening to the New York Times. You yeah. know what I mean? If we had just, and by the way, the press is what I think adulterated the CDC and Fauci. It made them freak out and, you know, have to do things that they shouldn't have done. Um, but be that as it may, uh, I apologized. And I said, look, I'm going to go, I'm going to go um, volunteer for the New York Corps of Physicians to go work in, in hospitals and the California Corps, which I signed up for immediately. And I actually went so far as the interview for the New York Corps. Uh, and at that point, the pandemic just ended. The New York Corps just stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they didn't ask me to come out here. But I had a really interesting experience um, with that with the interview because they started saying, you know, can you do this? Can you do this? And I, and I thought, yeah, I, I did that for years. And I thought, oh, my God, internists aren't able to do that anymore. You have to be a hospitalist. If you if, Back in the day, yeah, I did yeah. all of it. And so I was looking forward to it, to come out and you really use my skills again. And they just never asked me to come. And the California thing was in disarray. They never, they never even got me into an interview. I don't know what they were doing. I, after this whole thing, one of the things I want to do heading toward the end of my life. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're heading to what I'm... You're getting too much... You're, you're, you're getting too involved with your character, Mr. <laughs> Biden. <laughs> I, know, too. I know. But, you know, you have this sense of that, too. You had a... Uh, I think you have a good sense of mortality, having had oh, yeah. your brush with cancer. Well, that and, and I look. I, in, in, I'm a general internist, and one of the things I noticed early on in my internal medicine training was, oh, when everybody else is done with them, they send them to us to die. Uh, we do the death and dying stuff, and so death and dying is a very distinct reality for me. And I'm familiar with it. I know what it is. I know how it works, and it can be gracious and, and dignified. And we shouldn't be so. We shouldn't hide it away so damn much. We should be. Able, it should be. Life should be celebrated. We're living ninety years these days. We have to celebrate that, and we can do so. And you are a, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like a seize the day kind of guy since the cancer. I think right. This is the way you always talk. This is why you did this. The the masked singer. Right? No, no. The cancer didn't bother me at all because I I didn't bother you. But after didn't no. Uh-uh, when quite. I said why did you do mass singer and you said. Look, I'm not going to be around forever. I want to do these. There's certain things. Yeah, I because to my, do. I was losing my voice. Okay, uh-huh. that had nothing to do with cancer. I, I I used to be an opera singer for like when I was very young, right? And I noticed I was losing my mid range, and it turns out I have all kinds of structural problems in my chords. And I thought, if I'm going to do anything public, I better do it right now because okay. that's going away. That I don't like. I, I like that less than the damn prostate cancer. Yeah. So I look I, when I got prostate cancer, I thought, oh my god, at 50, I, I knew I'd get it by 70. It was no doubt in my mind because dad, uncle, everybody. Had it, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get it. But at 50, I was like, oh, that is that is that is not fair. Uh, but immediately, the next thought of my head was, oh, I'd much rather have that cancer than any other, than mm-hmm. any other, because it's it's slow it's growing, it's easy yeah. to treat, it's you know, it, it, most of the outcomes are very very good if you get it in time. But I think every Treated. time I talk to you on a personal level now, yeah. I hear some form of. Look, we're not going to be around forever. We'll just do this now. Last time I was talking about Joe Biden, he said, "Oh, I got to do another one of those Joe Biden videos." And you said, "Relish that." Oh, so oh yeah. Be around forever. You're not going to like. Oh no, no. I just, good I, like. I know, feel that way a, about everything. Yes. I, I'm so. I, that's called gratitude, my friend. Uh-huh. I am so grateful. I look. I told my son the other day. I said, "I I should just be in my office." And then the I would still be in the hospital. I don't know how I would have done that, but I love hospital work. And I worked in a psychiatric hospital for 30 years. I did. I had this incredible experience. 
And this thing happened to me by accident. It was a radio show, and then a TV show, and then another TV show. And I would just sort of go, all right, what's that? Let's explore that, see how that works. And yeah. I would just do it. It wasn't until about 2010 to 2014 I started looking at myself going, okay, you're, you've got three TV shows. You're in television. <laughs> Pay attention to it. Because I was really always like, whoa, no, no. Yeah, really. yeah. This is uh, not my real career. Yeah, but, but then when I started really sort of trying to use all this, this you know, to, to do something good, it's been very satisfying, I mean, very, and so I'm so grateful for all this. I, like I said, it's so much easier than practicing medicine. This is fun and creative, yeah. and makes a big difference. You can make a difference. I'm so, so, so grateful for all this stuff, and it just happened to me. It, it wasn't a plan. Trust me, still isn't a plan. I don't know what yeah, this technology keeps evolving. I just go, all right, let's go try that. Um, yeah. So my wife's now producing everything I do digitally, which is, but who knew that would happen? That's crazy, and she's very talented at it. But was she talented at it, or she learned because of what she, you had to do? I, she's always been a very creative, talented person. She, but she wasn't in the TV business. No, yeah, who yeah. knew she was good at this? This is like out of the blue for me. Yeah. Um, so what I was saying about the, I, I look to myself at, at the back half of my life, mm. you know, and you're thinking, okay, how are we going to manage this, uh, you know, going forward? I'm a comedian. I want to have a, a I want to keep performing. I want to keep busy, you know, yeah. and. And so I'm looking at the back half of my career, the back half of my life. And because of this whole COVID thing, I want to get a handle on, uh, you know, medical. I, I don't I don't trust the hospitals. I don't trust mm. the medical system. Mm. I want to find a good doctor yes. who's got one of those things around his neck. And, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, like, the, like I want to get a good family doctor who I trust. Yes. I don't want to be okay. in the hospital until I have to. OK, and this is something that happened during COVID. People are rushing to hospital. They shouldn't have been in the hospital. Correct. They should have had their doctor. Yes. And dying in the hospital. We were talking about death and dying. That's yeah. a bad idea. You should die at home. Yep. With hospice. They know what they're doing. But in any event, um, so interesting. You probably aren't going to find what you want without some sort of concierge service. A concierge doctor. Which yeah. means you pay eight hundred dollars a year for the privilege of having somebody spend time with you, right? Because otherwise, they're just they're, they have to go every five minutes. They have to just go, 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 go. Because insurances dictate what they can and can't do, right? Uh, and if they and if they get that you know base, then they are they're secure for the year or whatever or whatever month, and they can kind of take their time and not 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 mill through everybody. So in all probability, you you need that kind of doctor. I would advise that you you look at people's training. This, I, this is the interesting thing to me is people don't ask about doctor's training. Ask about our training. Yeah. Where'd you go to undergraduate? But How do you, I know that? Well, they say Stanford. That sounds great to me. I mean, well, I, they, if you did a, if you did a Stanford degree in French literature, you might go, well, what have, when you get to the sciences, as opposed to somebody who did a biochemistry degree or maybe has a graduate degree in biochemistry, you know there's a scientist there. Mm -hmm. you, I, I want to know there's a scientist. You don't have to have that. I also want to know this humanitarian, so you to be able to speak a couple languages and be well read. I, I'm all for that too for the doctorate. Check this out. But we want you to do that. Also, where'd you go to medical school? Now that's probably not as important because all the medical schools are kind of equivalent, kind of. Uh, and then where'd you do your training? Have you been where have you been teaching? Where do you teach? In what departments do you teach? In what capacity do you teach? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. And like people never ask me that. I, I'm, an, I'm a fellow of the American College of Physicians. They fell the American Board of Addiction Medicine. I taught in three different departments for decades: uh, internal medicine, adolescent medicine, and uh, psychiatry. Mostly in psychiatry. I think a lot of people just for you know they see Dr. Drew. They knew about Love Line. Yeah. They knew about this, and I think they just think you were a psych psychologist or a yeah. psychiatrist. No, and then I'm you an kind internist. Of I, yeah. I did I general medicine, inpatient medicine, and then initially medicine in a psychiatric setting, and then addiction in the psychiatric setting. And uh, I got to see everything. I had to learn everything because addiction is right at the crossroads of everything. Mm -hmm. So, but it was a great privilege. And now I want to just give that back. I would like to share it because again, doctors aren't getting that that experience and today. What I did, you'd have to either be a hospitalist or an outpatient internist, or a or a uh, psychiatrist or an addiction medicine doctor, and it you, you nobody sees all of it the way I did. And I I think that was an incredible. Ex view of the human experience, and I, I like to share that, that's all.
So anyway, I didn't answer your question. Your question of how to get the doctor. So the other thing, once you get the doctor, what's a concierge service? I mean, you said you got to find a. Con- you do have I to know pay that? a yearly fee. What are the big ones though? What's like the? They big- will say they will say I'm a concierge doctor. You can look at I me. Mean, is the, it like those things? You know, the, the a new be, way to a new way to do health, and then they have like, the some of it is that, but mostly you want a person in in space. You want a human that you can go see, uh, but you want access through media and stuff through yeah, through yeah. FaceTime or whatnot if if you should know so need it, and then you go in. Then you go there, you make sure you're comfortable with how the office operates, who the office personnel is, who you're going to be able to contact when you need somebody. Are you going to see the doctor or a nurse practitioner? But concierge, usually you see the doctor, usually. And then meet with that doctor and talk about these things about hospitalization and end of life and make sure he or she is exactly lined up with you or at least is willing to defend your point of view on, on your medical care. I want a Catholic doctor. Is that weird? I mean, I want a, no. I want a doctor who believes I have a soul. Okay. Because you, you may not have to look just Catholic. There may be other ways. Well, of you know, go, let's go Catholic. If I'm going to go, you know, I mean, I if you want to go, go all the way, go all the way. Go, you know, go <laughs> Rome or go home. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I've, I've not encountered a lot of people wanting a specific religious thing. Well, the se. thing is, I want them to be religious, not because I want them to, you know, pray away a sickness or something. Yeah. I want them to know that as an old person, I am planning a hereafter, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's not just a... Uh, Listen, but for those of us that, again, deal with death and dying, people that have a very strong faith and a very clear sense of an afterlife, I'm, we're jealous of you guys. Like, it's, I'm so jealous. It makes end of life much better. Yeah. Much better. I, I, I'm always like... So go for it then. You can't. I, I don't have it in me the same way. I, I I've noticed that. I, can you fake it till you make it? Do you, you know? You can. That? You can. And I've noticed as I've gotten older, this is generally a trend people get. As they get older, they start thinking more about afterlife. Something they start concocting these things a, a little bit because it helps you deal with aging. Yeah. You know. But by the way, in terms of aging, well, that's sort of what you're asking about. Vigorous exercise. Yeah. I'm telling you, resistance training. It's key, key, key. Oh, you say vigorous exercise and resistance training, so well, you want to have both of those. I, I, so you don't think a guy just don't run around and get on no, a treadmill. You don't no. want to do. You I want actually to work do, with the wait, thing. You want to I, lift weights. The same. I work with this program called V Shred that is a combination of these things. And what what people leave out is this sort of hit cardio. So you you do your resistance training and you hit some cardio for very brief and yeah, yeah. periods throughout. It's 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 the way to go. Uh-huh. So. I do a little, I mean, I do, I do yoga, mm. I do the kettlebell stuff, mm. I do calisthenics, uh, and... Resistance training. I mean, what, isn't the kettlebell? Wait, yes, but do it. Like, okay. Do it. Yeah. Don't hurt your joints like I did. I destroyed my shoulders. Uh, destroyed myself. And, uh, so what else? So what's going to happen in the world? I mean, you got Kennedy... I mean, so we'll, what's going to we'll happen? We'll finish up. Let's figure it out. No problem. We'll just look. We'll everybody just, hates each other. Everyone's screaming at God, each it's other. It's terrible. We. Uh, it looks like we're about to have. Well, this, let me tell you, you a story. Know, yeah. I'm going to tell you a story. So it'll help everybody feel better because I, I really feel like part of our job in media is to help people like making people upset and and spin and anxious is not helping them. Never make, anxiety and panic never makes things better. Yeah. Ever. It was really what upset me about COVID. Um, mm-hmm. I was on a plane. Uh, coming out here, and uh, it was a book on my chair, and it was a Lenin biography. I heard Mark Andreessen talking about it on Lex Friedman's podcast. I immediately went out and got and started reading his great biography of Lenin. Because yeah. I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on right now, because the echoes of history are all over the place. Yeah, And you'd be shocked how mm-hmm. how much this has happened before. Uh, and I'm it's sitting there. This woman comes by on the aisle, and she goes, "Oh, oh, do you like this book?" And she, I go, "Yeah, I do." Matter of fact, I, I told the story, and she goes, "You know, I was a musicologist, and I switched careers and became a historian and an expert in Eastern Europe, particularly East Germany and how East Germany evolved." And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe you can kind of help me." And she goes, "It's gonna." And she goes, "There's cycles of history everywhere." Um, and they're not exactly the same, but they tend to follow these patterns. And the Weimar Republic was very much like the kinds of things we're going through now. Things will get worse, a lot worse, and then they will be great for about 40 years. And how long How long is it going to take, though? I don't know. Yeah, she that's... couldn't say it. That's the part I keep asking everybody. Like, how long do we think it's going to take? Just when I think it's starting to melt, boom. Somebody does something screwy. Have you heard about this fourth, the fourth turning? Yeah, I've read it. Okay, you read that book. Yeah, I, I got the audio book and I went through it because I had seen a play. Speaking of Catholics, I saw a a play about a bunch of Catholics. It's called Heroes of the Fourth Turning, 
And it was a bunch of these conservative Catholics in a cabin having an argument and talking about this fourth turning thing. And I said, well, I don't even know what the fourth turning is. So I got the book. And uh, I mean, the book was written, I think, in the 90s. And yeah. it's like, it's coming. The yeah. four, you know, yeah. we're about to, you know, it well, looks actually, like the fourth turning went by. and we, we Right. We, they, he would have predicted it already happened the way they were, the way they were building it up. Yeah. I, I don't know what to make of all that, but I do know that there's clearly patterns. And I have sort of been looking at the patterns of the predominant personalities in a culture. And I wrote a book on narcissism, or did some studies on narcissism and wrote a book about it. And in that book, I've mentioned, I think, on many other places, that I wanted to write a chapter on pre-revolutionary France. Because it was the only, other than the Aztecs, it was the only culture I could find where there was so much abuse of children, sexual, physical abandonment. Pre-revolutionary France was, oh really? my God, terrible. Like, only one in six children, actually. I, I mean, it was just, they leave kids on the doorstep of, of uh, yeah. orphanages, routine. The freaking Rousseau had five children. He had this concubine he dragged around with him. Rousseau's an asshole. Yeah. And, and oh, Rousseau, the, you know, the great, the, 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 the uh, what was it, the, the kind native, you know. He's an asshole. He carried around a concubine. She had five children. He forced her to leave these kids in the, on the stairs of a uh, orphanage. Only one out of five children at that time survived the orphanages. Sexual abuse of children was rampant. It was just so many. And Fr the French, whom I love, and by the way, I'm, I'm fascinated with French history. Yeah. They gloss over so much horrible stuff. It's unbelievable. And uh, so I kept saying, I think we are in some sort of wave like that where childhood, childhood injury creates narcissism. Narcissism creates unregulated rage and grandiosity. Mm -hmm. And when narcissists need to express that rage so they don't destroy each other, they scapegoat. When scapegoating develops, and that's the guillotine, right? I kept saying there's gonna be a there's gonna be guillotines. I just see the scapegoating mechanism starting to come up. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about cancellation. I didn't know about so there wasn't even social media yet when I wrote that book, really. And so we're in a, a a scapegoating phase, uh, and the grand the grandiose caring. Oh, you're so much. That's yeah. not caring. Yeah. That's not caring. I saw somebody use some language. I was in a big event a couple nights ago, and he used some language that was like, mm, I did, I did, made everyone uncomfortable, and this 20-year-old kid behind me go, you're an asshole, boo, boo, boo. And I was like, hey, you want to change what that guy says? Walk down there, go, hey, man, you're doing a lot of good work, but hey, you, did your, the way that lands, you might want to think about how you're using that language. As opposed to <gasps> yeah. tearing my shirt off and I'm grandiose caring. That is disgusting and it's narcissistic and it is not actual caring. If you actually cared, you'd want to change that guy's use of language and you'd go talk to him. Yeah, that's, that's caring. The, they're just want everyone to know it's me. Yeah, yeah. Pa the chest pounding and stuff. Anyway, that's all narcissism. It's all narcissism. We've had this huge narcissistic wave. I saw it happen at the psychiatric hospital in the 80s mm -hmm. when I arrived there and started working there. The narcissistic, di the, the personality disorder diagnoses were all over the place. By the end of the 80s, it was all cluster B. It just went towards narcissism. By the 90s, it was only cluster B. What's, now, what's cluster B? Borderline, sociopath, narcissist, and essentially those three. Oh, so th those three together make the cluster B. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we, it was, I mean, the histrionic is the other part of that. And I n was not saying histrionic, and yet our behavior during COVID was full histrionic. Yeah. That was histrionic behavior. And so I'm interested in how these childhood experiences and these parenting styles result in these personality trends that, you know, that I, I just saw a Julia Louise Dreyfus movie on the way over here too, where in the movie she, she plays the mom of this 25 year old kid and it, he is sort of failing, failing, failing and she's constantly rescuing him, telling him he's great. He's, she, he goes, no, I'm not. You, I'm failing because you told me I was great my whole life. So I never got a realistic sense of what I can and can't do. Yeah. And that's the newest incarnation. So that's her narcissism, right? She can't just stand to see him uncomfortable because it triggers her pain. That's her narcissism creating a certain kind of narcissism in him. I think it's the final wave. I think it's the last wave of the narcissism. And then we'll sort of turn back to more, uh, you know, very, very kinds of disorders. Yeah, there was something I was going to say on Gutfeld recently because we were talking about something and I didn't have time to say it because yeah. it was kind of a long thought, but it was essentially about 
that, that well, idea. Well, Craig gives that, you tons of time. Well, that's it. <laughs> no, he does Yeah. If you, if you talk long, he'll go, well, that wasn't funny. It'll, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll just he'll he'll distill. Say, oh, I don't even know why I can't yeah, I know. I know. He'll just still cut you down. But it was about the idea. The idea was basically that my dad's generation yeah. were... They were. They didn't think of themselves as big men. They thought of themselves as men in. Uh, and they they had. They didn't have a lot of. Uh, I don't want to say they didn't have self respect. They didn't have hubris yeah. about themselves. Yeah. There was. There was. A, they were right sized. They were right sized. Right sized. But and, they had and, respect for the culture at large. They had respect for the institutions yeah. around them and the world at large. And they saluted the flag. But they themselves weren't a great man. They were a man in this great world. Yeah. And I think th I think of my generation now as people who are, they think they're great, they're not getting what they deserve, they have no respect for the institutions, but I'm one of, I don't have respect for the institutions because I'm looking at them, they're not, they're not behaving well, these institutions. They're not, but, but we need to restore them. I think to be happy, tell me if you agree with this, mm. you have to feel that you, that the world is greater than you, and I think everyone's walking around thinking they're greater than the world. Correct. And so, th that, you know, again, working with people with Awful, awful problems for many decades. Some, some. I'm going to tell you what's what is needed for flourishing, right? And Aristotle got onto this early. So what's needed for and, and we can use the word happiness. I think happiness is a misguided term because in this country we think happiness is euphoria, yeah, and everything we want. And you know, the, the, look, when, when I first started talking, seeing the happiness conversation come in in this country, it was about 25 years ago. And I kept saying, there's nobody happier than my heroin addicts when they get their first hit. They're happy. <laughs> that is not a good life. Yeah. And it's not flourishing. So we got to think more in terms of what is necessary, what's more nourishing than happiness, which is a good life, which is flourishing. Uh, Aristotle said you needed uh, three things. Uh, you needed techne, some, some sort of skill. You needed phronesis, which was wisdom. And you develop that, you train for that. I mean, I, I'm grateful I have some of that from all this experience I've had in practicing medicine. And then service. You, using that, but not service on a grand scale. But, you know, Anna Janet, uh, um, you know, not like the, that kid or not like anybody else, you know, not, not it's just one offering service to one human being. Be useful. One, yeah. But for one person in a real way, that's what nourishes a human being. And I would also add that, so in addition to that mechanism of, of developing things that we have to offer that can help a person or a family, you should have some concept of faith, whatever that is, just to get out of your own head. Like you said, faith in the institutions, faith in God, whatever. So faith, uh, gratitude. If you're, if you're cultivating gratitude, you're in very good shape. And I've, whenever I notice I'm feeling grateful, I thought, oh, I must be doing okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to really work at mm, entering the frame with other people, like being close to other humans, spending time with other humans. If you can do that and also be of service, you're, you're on your way to a life that usually is quite satisfying. I mean, everything else is gravy. I think we, uh, I, I, by the way, would add one more thing. Yeah. Uh, that I never ever contemplated in, in, in I didn't need to but I think you need freedom oh and and I, I never ever a whole life in this country I never thought about it all of a sudden freedom is a word that comes across my lips all the time and then the bravery whatever word you want to use the ability to stand up for it yeah and that's going to be more important because the um you know, even if the people are not totalitarians, yeah. the way that it's going is the way that these, you know, and I don't even like using the word globalist because people start to think it, yeah. you know, like you a paranoid, paranoid person. Yeah, but yeah, yeah it's global. And globalism is coming in. People want to automate everything. They want things moving, you know, in I, a mechanized I way. I would just tell you the what I've noticed in medicine, I've noticed in just about everything else these days, is the more decentralized, the better. Yeah. In all things, whether it's the economy or the practice of medicine or the politics, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was a, fa a famous, wrote, wrote a famous book in the 1820s called Democracy in the Mar America, he was a Frenchman that came here to study the penitentiary system. And he said that the reason democracy works in America is the local practice of democracy. Yeah, but nobody, it's all going the other way now. Correct. Nobody wants to do that. Everyone mistake. says we need to, and every time something mistake. happens, 
whether it, after 9-11, well, we needed everyone to be on the same page. Now we need to, uh, you know, we need the CIA to work with uh, MI6 and work, and everything was not decentralized. It was, yeah. it was about, let's re-centralize it. Yeah. Then with COVID, oh, well, no one's on the same page. Everyone has to have the same rules, like, you know, yeah, the same no. crazy rules. It's a bad so, mistake. It's a terrible, terrible, I hope we learn something from that, I hope. It's a terrible, terrible mistake. And, and again, the globalists are just another level of integration and, de and centralization, you know, away from the family, frankly. It's the, yeah. you know, the family and the doctor and the patient and the, the small business owner. I mean, this is, these are the fundamental building blocks of a, of a good society. Humbly, humbly. Well, uh, hopefully we can, uh, I, like I said, I don't know where, I was aiming for 25 minutes because that's, I have a sh generally short attention span for. Well, I want to do that. I want to do that bit with you. So Susan, if you're yeah. watching, I have pitched it to him. And well, let's go for it. We're live now. So don't tell them what the bit I is. I won't. I'm not going to. We have an idea for, for Gutfeld, really. For right? Gutfeld. Yeah. And, for Gutfeld. Uh, Would it be for tomorrow night? Let's, if it is, yeah, it will be. I'm in, if, if we have a show, I'm in there with you. Yes. And that would be kind of funny to do that because Kat is supposed to pay out a, Loveline skit that we did years ago that was the first time I was ever on Gutfeld. Well, yeah, yeah, since he left Red Eye, uh, and she's never followed up. So let's beat her to the punch. What do you mean? She's supposed to? She did one with you, and she, now we you did one. Up. We were supposed to do a whole series, and she never did it. So we got we got to get on that. You can you can make her do that. Okay, so how do we end this with? Um, I don't know. I think what, I just what, have to. Which we button. say to? No, 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 no. no I mean, like, literally, how do I end it? Sometimes I don't want to let me. <laughs> how do you work this damn thing? Oh, I should say why I'm dressed up like this. Yes. Or maybe please. should I leave it a mystery or? Uh, watch. What was should they watch? Saturday if, show. If they watch, watch the Saturday show. Fox News Saturday night, they will see why I'm dressed in this outfit. And and he likes it too. He digs it. Yeah. He. he uh, why, why did you come up with a Charles Nelson Riley uh, invitation? And this, do you know who that is? Yeah, Charles, okay. yeah. Well, you're, you're dressed just like him right now. We just put some big glasses on here. I mean, yeah, I've, got, I've got some weird uh, sunglasses that maybe would work for. Charles I like Nelson wearing the Riley. neckerchief oh. and uh, the and the the track suit I got as an homage to uh, Steve Austin uh, uh, in, in a sketch for Godfather. The, Godfeld, great, the great Steve Austin. It's gonna uh, come in again. And Lee Majors watches the show, by the way. Oh, no. He, he's a, and he calls Gutfeld after the five, and they talk about the issues. Why doesn't he bring him on the show? I, I, maybe he's... Uh, there are so many people that would be great on that show. Yeah. Oh, Lee Majors should do the show. Yes. If he's in New York, but maybe... I know he's down in Texas, and uh, apparently he's going to come see my show when I'm in Houston. Oh, my God. Do you ever go to Austin? I've uh, been to Austin, but well, I... Well, I do a show called After Dark that I film in Austin. you got to come on that one. He's so busy. So I know this is always I'm grateful, things. grateful, grateful to do all this stuff. I'm so excited just to do stuff, try stuff. This this is fun. Slide to stop. Okay, so I clicked okay. on the red button and then it says slide to stop. Okay, slide so let's say goodbye first. Let's say goodbye first, okay. and, but also let's do a quick plug for the thing you're doing with oh, the yeah. so it's uh, uh, Let me get to the date on it. It's RFK Jr. and Mosimo Hatra. The date is October. Hold a second. Holding. And it's, it's the, I believe. The 27th of October. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, crap. It might be the 28th. But what's it going to be on? What what medium it will it be? It, Just it's it's a it's a huge theater. You've got to come. Oh, oh so it's a live show. It's not, yeah. not going to be streaming. It's well, we're show. trying to set it up so we can stream it also. Okay. So look on my website for the stream if we're able to do it. Where is San Jose? It's just below um, San Francisco. It's where, it's where all the... The tech companies are. It's where all the where it's where all the venture capital is that funds the tech companies. Oh, but it's below. It's Northern California then. Yeah, it's just it's just like a half hour below San Francisco. Uh, yeah. It's right by the airport. Have you ever That's heard of San? That. Backrack wrote that song. Do you know the way to San Jose? Well, that was before San Jose was San Jose. That was a little horse town then. But now it's Sand Hill Road, which is this crazy money. Yeah. But uh, 28th, the 28th of October. It is a Saturday. And uh, we'd love to see you there. We'd love to see you if we do stream it. Uh, keep an eye out for that. And it's going to be about um, capture and the excesses and what do we do about things like food and healthcare and mandates around healthcare that where they're seemingly we're losing our ability to take care of ourselves and our family without people muscling us into things that we might not want to do or we might not want we might want to have access to different things. I, I really I. You know, and to be clear about my position, for say on vaccines, my elderly patients are all vaxxed and boosted. They all are. They clearly have benefited from it. I've seen no side effects. I've seen a crap ton of side effects in forty-year-old males, and I don't know why we vaccinated them at all. Because after the Alpha Delta wave, everyone's had it, 
and fine if they want to take a single vaccine, but the, but the boosting is just increasing the risk of adverse events and not getting much out of it. I totally so, so agree I with that. I don't understand why the push on young people and children, I don't understand it. I, if somebody can explain it to me, yes, it, it works, but again, for a 22-year-old male, the risk of COVID is approaching zero. Yeah. The risk of myocarditis is turning out to be quite a bit more than we thought. And the and the consequence of that myocarditis, based on that circulation article that was printed just three days ago, looks breathtaking and concerning. So Very concerning, but they're going to deny it. And I think, you know, when people always say, well, the answer is money, it's money, it's money. But but it's not just the money it's for hysteria. the vaccine. It's weird hysteria we're in. But yeah, they're making a lot of money off the people vaccine, but it's wrong. not just that. I yeah. think it's this mRNA dream. Like they want, oh, yeah. they want the dream of mRNA yeah. and they, that, that dream that they, that they, that they used to talk about the idea that, well, pretty soon everyone is going to have a, yeah. a, you know, mRNA and it's going to, yeah. and then you could just change it in the lab. and then No, it is a dream. great technology. I share that dream, but not yet, but well, you know, we we originally conceived of these mRNA products for cancer. Yeah, where somebody's dying, so it's worth the risk, and it was, and like I said, worth the risk of my elderly patients because they would get. I, I mean, I am I have very complicated medical patients, and they need protection. Um, and and elderly people don't seem to have the same risk of side effects. I have not seen anything in my elderly patients. Nothing. They seem fine. But even with them, this latest booster. I'm not quite sure why I'm giving it to them because there's no data and the XSB is going away and the EG is coming in, but it's covering the XSB, but maybe it covers the XG, I, the EG rather, but I, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing. I'm losing track of the science because it's it's not really science. I'm way reasonable. over the other side on that. So. All right, all right. So I, I'm, again, moderate, moderate, moderate. Reasonable, moderate. Crazy, That's crazy. Crazy, right wingers. Extremist, <laughs> reactionary. <you know. laughs> Catholic. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, we can get... The rad tries, we get pretty serious. With no, it. listen, I, I used to think that I, I've done a bit of history digging around Catholicism, and uh, I ended up with great respect for what the church was trying to do. It, it, it had excesses, right? Mm -hmm. It had periods where you, you're not, no one's happy with what they did, but they were trying, really trying to get it right, the, intellectually. Yeah. They were trying to be scientists. They just didn't have the discipline to do it, and then they were condemning people like Galileo who did have the capacity. It's just an interesting thing. Yeah. Look, that's a, that was overstated too a little bit with the Galileo thing. You know, they the, the There's a great there's a you know, so so faith and reason. That's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. And that what would Pope Paul the great Pope John what was the, the really last great Pope that everyone loved? Well John, John Paul John Paul the, 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 Pope, the Polish was, guy. Yes. Yeah. He he um he said something profound. He said faith and reason are the two wings upon which the human ascends to the contemplation of truth. I love that. Come on. Yeah. And even if it's just faith that the world isn't going to run off its axis or the laws of physics will continue to work or whatever that faith is, he is right. Much like I heard Ben Carson say, he goes, you need a right wing and a left wing of a, of a government so that the bird can fly effectively. You need both wings fully engaged. Yeah, yeah. And it's true. Faith and reason, they go together. And But you have these people that are just, no, no, I'm going to live on reason alone. And uh, it's certainly not the way to happiness, that's for sure. It's not the way to happiness, and it results in hubris. Yeah. And hubris is the enemy right now. So rational uncertainty, everybody. Stay in that zone. Okay. And watch Gutfeld tomorrow night. Yeah, well, this well, is are you going to be there? Other than hopefully. This? I'll be in the office, and hopefully you'll I'll be, have you'll some be, stuff to do. Okay. And well, yeah, you have we'll, to wait and see what that stuff is. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Drew. Bye -bye. Slide. Uh-oh. Yeah, there it is.